All right, well, let's continue on with Jeremiah chapter 27. I'm going to uh, make a couple more observations this morning from this chapter before we close it out. Uh, a little bit of review in this reading, just so we can understand what's going on here. Jeremiah uh, showed up last week with a uh, wooden yoke and chains and uh, gave a message to all of these uh, messengers from other kingdoms, other uh, nations surrounding uh, Jerusalem and uh, the king of Jerusalem as well, and said, uh, don't believe the false prophets, take the yoke, take the chains, submit to Babylon, and you will survive. And if you don't, you will die, you will perish. And meanwhile, the other guys, uh, the other false prophets are contradicting and uh, going against Jeremiah's word and what they are prophesying. They have prophesied, Jeremiah 27, verse 10, a lie to you in order to remove you far from the land, and I will drive you out, and you will perish. But the nation that will bring its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let him remain in this land, declares the Lord, and they will till it and they will dwell therein. I spoke words like this to Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, bring your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why will you die, you and your people, by the sword and famine of pestilence, as the Lord has spoken to the nation which will not serve the king of Babylon? So, do not listen to the words of the prophets who speak to you, saying, You will not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. And I have not sent them, declares the Lord, but they prophesy falsely in my name, in order that I might drive you out, and that you may perish and you and the prophets who prophesy to you. Then I spoke to the priest and to all this people saying, Thus says the Lord, do not listen to the words of your prophets who prophesy to you saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's host, the, of the Lord's house will now shortly be brought again from Babylon, for they are prophesying a lie to you. Don't listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Why should this city become a ruin? But... If they are prophets, and if the word of the Lord is with them, let them now entreat the Lord of hosts that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah and Jerusalem, may not go to Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the pillars, the seas, the stands, the rest of the vessels that are left in this city, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, did not take with him and carry into exile. When, when he carried into exile, Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah from Jerusalem to Babylon, all the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem, yes, thus says the Lord of hosts, the king of Israel, concerning those vessels that are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah and Jerusalem, they will be carried to Babylon, and they will be there until the day I come to visit them, declares the Lord. Then I will bring them back and restore them to this place. <clears throat> so, a little bit of a technical argument there. We'll get into what all that means. Back when Eliana was teaching second grade in Virginia, she would come home every day, pretty well every day, with a new story about a particular child who was a huge disciplinary problem. I won't use his real name in this story because he was just a child. Let's just call him Johnny. Let's just call him Johnny, right? Little Johnny had a big problem telling the truth. He was very conniving when he wanted his way, and he would lie about what the other children said and did, and he would lie about his own actions when he was confronted. He would be caught red-handed by Mrs. McNutt, but instead of admitting and apologizing, he would defiantly lie and defend himself. And this wasn't just happening in the classroom with other children. If Mrs. McNutt sent a, ever sent a note home informing the parents of Johnny's actions, the parents would come back and say, well, Johnny said, this is what's happening, and we have to believe our son. So Johnny was lying to his parents. So Mrs. McNutt had a very hard time disciplining Johnny because he would deflect and blame, deflect the blame onto others, and his parents would side with him even over the teacher's word. So that was what was going on until... One day, Johnny told Mrs. McNutt a story about how he was being horribly mistreated at home by his parents. And since Mrs. McNutt has years of education and experience in counseling and community service field, she knows the signs of such scenarios, and nothing about little Johnny's story was adding up. She knew it was, yet again, 
one of Johnny's attempts to keep himself out of trouble by lying this time about his mom and dad. So, in a parent-teacher conference, when the topic of Johnny's version of what was happening in the classroom came up and they were defending and supporting their son yet again, Mrs. McNutt said, well, to Johnny's father, Johnny says, this is what you're doing at home, and this is how you're treating him, and this is all the horrible things he's suffering from you. And Johnny's dad's eyes got big, and his jaw hit the floor, and he was shocked to hear about all the lies that his son was spinning about his mom and dad. And Mrs. McNutt said, now don't worry, Mr. Johnny's dad. You being a loving parent with a stable home life and a Christian man, I would never... Take the word of a child over yours. I would know better than to do that. <laughs> she clever. Johnny's dad got the message. He recognized he wasn't giving Mrs. McNutt, the adult, the professional, the Christian teacher, with a track record of good character, the same courtesy. He was taking the word of his poorly behaved eight-year-olds over Hers, and it dawned on him in that parent-teacher meeting that when he received, was on the receiving ends of Johnny's lies, that he was believing a big fat liar. Needless to say, after that meeting, Mrs. McNutt never again had to fight with Johnny's dad over whose version of what was happening was the truth. This morning, we want to talk about who do you believe? Who's lying? Four times the Lord says through Jeremiah in chapter 27, four times he says, the prophets are lying to you. Verse number 10, he says it, for they prophesy a lie to you in order to remove you from the land. Verse 14, do not listen to the words of the prophets who speak to you, who say, you will not serve the king of Babylon. They prophesy a a lie to you. Verse 15, I've not sent them, declares the Lord, but they prophesy a falsely in my name. And again in verse 16, then I spoke to the priests and to all the people saying, thus says the Lord, don't listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you saying, behold the vessels of the Lord's house. Now shortly will be brought back again from Babylon for they are prophesying a lie to you. A seker is the Hebrew word, deception, mis misleading falseness a state or condition which is utterly false that causes mistaken belief. That's what it means. It's utterly false causing mistaken belief. The prophets are saying, thus says the Lord, we will not be driven out of the land. God will protect us. God will defend us. The treasures that Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple, they're all going to be brought back real soon. And everyone says, all right, that's a wonderful message. Thank you, prophets of the Lord. What a blessing you are. God is so good to us. It's a great message. But the problem is that message wasn't from God. He didn't say any of that. Matter of fact, he didn't say anything to these prophets. So even though it sounded good and it was the message that the people wanted to hear from God, it wasn't from God. It was a lie, a falseness that was causing mistaken belief. But it can be really hard to tell sometimes who's lying. You 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 get some information and you you know you hear some, you know, go the news, or you go to the web, and you, you learn some information. You say, okay, well, I, I learned some things today, and based on my information that I have received, I now think, and I now feel, and I now believe. Based on the prophet's good prophecy, I now believe that we won't be taken to Babylon. How are people supposed to know that this is a lie? Jeremiah, just because you say they're lying, but they say you're lying. So, you know, we don't know. And this is a real problem for us today, isn't it? Every day we go to the news and we receive new information, new studies, show. This is a, this is a, this is a very coincidental, hilarious thing. I, I read this news article this morning, uh, Friday morning, as I was putting the sermon together. The title of this news article said, Beware those scientific studies most are wrong, researchers warn. And I was like, oh my, <laughs> this just might be a great illustration. So I had to read this article. 
A few years ago, two researchers took the 50 most used ingredients in a cookbook, studied how many had been linked with a cancer risk or benefit based on a variety of studies published in scientific journals. The result, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll relate to this. You'll probably go, wow, I've, this sure seems like truth. 40 out of the 50, including salt, flour, parsley, and sugar, are linked to cancer. Is everything we eat associated with cancer? Have you ever wondered that? You're like, man, it's like everything I eat because I just get tired. You know, I, I'm like, I don't care. I'm getting cancer. I'm just eating because I'm starving over here. I don't know what to eat. Is everything linked with cancer? The researchers wondered in a 2013 article based on their findings. Their investigations touched on a known but persistent problem in the research world that too few studies have a large enough sample to support generalized conclusions. But pressure on researchers, com competition between journals, and the media's insatiable appetite for new studies announcing revolutionary breakthroughs has meant that such articles continue to get published. The majority of the papers that get published, even in serious journals, are pretty sloppy, said John Ioannidis, a professor of medicine at Stanford University who specializes in the study of scientific studies. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. This John Ioannidis, the sworn enemy of bad research, published a, world, a widely cited article in 2005 and listed why most published research findings are false. And since then, he said, there's only been a limited amount of progress made. When you read something like, new study, scientists have discovered, part of us immediately wants to take that at face value because science right? As you said, science. And, you know, scientists have made so many incredible breakthroughs in our lifetime. It's just natural for us to want to simply trust what we hear that discovery is. Just take it at first face value. Studies show that, you know, two cups of coffee and two chocolate bars and two glasses of wine prevent cancer. Woohoo! Like that study. You know, let the prevention begin. Or for some of you, let it continue. <laughs> Oh, wait, uh, new studies show that two cups of coffee, two chocolate bars, and two glasses of wine causes cancer. Ah, I'm just going to die now. Which is it? Which do we believe? You know, growing up in school, in health class, we learned from the Canadian food guide that there were four main food groups. There's fruits and veggies. There's grains, which make breads and cereals. There's dairy. And there's protein, my most favorite. And we were taught that we needed balance, right? You need a little bit of everything, part of a balanced breakfast, right? You need a little bit of all that. And they were all good, and they were all necessary for your balanced diet. But man, things have gotten complicated since I was in school because now there's hormones in meat, and there's GMOs, and there's pesticides on the produce. Too organic or not too organic? That is the question. That is the weekly debate in the McNutt household. Do we buy these $5 organic eggs? What? I can't afford $5 eggs. What are you talking about? Oh, so you just want us to die then. <laughs> because studies show... Studies show everything. I just only want to buy $1.50 dozen eggs. I just, I don't, what study shows me I'll go broke buying organic? Which do I believe? And the events that happen on, in the world of politics. You know, I saw pictures, I saw the footage, but then we learned that the pictures are not actually proving what the article says, that they were staged and were interpreted to match a certain bias. Nobody's actually reporting facts. People are just giving commentary based on how they feel. We saw this, this, this that time used this little girl, right, as the poster child of children being separated from their families at the border because it was a great picture that just pulled at America's heartstrings. Except for we found out that that little girl was never actually separated from her parents. It's just was a really great picture, but it wasn't actually the facts of, at that moment. So 
this is a challenging issue, isn't it? The, 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 the issue of immigration officers and, and how they're supposed to handle this very complicated, complex thing. And it's been going on for years. It didn't just happen in the last two months. It's been going on for years. But the media for the last month has turned it into a political weapon. When they do stuff like this, you realize that they're doing it, they're doing much more than simply reporting. They're sensationalizing for a purpose to get you to believe and feel what's to be emotional about what they're telling you. Man, crying babies, that, that makes me feel bad. And the article says it's bad. And immigration officers who enforce the border, they must be bad. Let's just fire them and eliminate the borders so no babies will ever cry in America ever again. <laughs> That's what some people have concluded. Now, me personally, I have immigrated to this country and I have been to South and Central America a few times, and I have family members from that part of the world, and I would submit to you that there are some very good reasons why you wouldn't want to eliminate the border. It would just be an unwise way to govern a nation. And I'm not heartless, and I'm not racist for believing that. I have information, and I have knowledge, and I have beliefs that impact my decision-making more so than just a picture of a crying baby. But all this is not to get political, I'm just bringing this up as an illustration to prove a point. The point being, it's very hard to know who to believe. Right? Just like it's hard for Americans to know who to listen to, it was also hard for people in Jeremiah's day to know who to listen to. Who's right and who's wrong? The prophets say God will save us from Babylon. And Jeremiah says, don't listen to those prophets and God is going to punish us with Babylon. Well, who's lying? Eh, you know, what does it matter anyways what you believe? You know, these, you have prophets, they have prophets. What's the difference? You know, you believe in the prophet Moses, they believe in the prophet Muhammad. Eh, let's just let people believe what they want. Stop being so dogmatic and so rigid and telling everybody who they got to, what they got to believe. Just let's all coexist. That's what people say nowadays, right? You shouldn't be pushing your beliefs and shoving them out of people's throats. Just let people believe what they want and respect them. Well... Their lies are causing mistaken beliefs that are leading to destruction for the people in Jeremiah's time and for the people in our time. When, when, when they believe the lies and they reject the truth, that means they're on their way to eternal damnation. So that isn't very respectful to just leave them alone. That's why we can't let this, we can't get this wrong. We have to discern, don't we? Who's lying? Well, in the case of Jeremiah, I think you have to, how you figure out who's telling the truth, who's lying, is you got to look at their track record, their track record. In chapter 27, verse number one tells us this message was delivered in the beginning of the reign of King Zedekiah. What was going on in the global scene? What was the life setting of these people? Well, this is in the time of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, whose empire spread throughout all the Middle East. And in 607 BC, King Jehoiakim of Judah, the father of King Zedekiah, was forced into submission and became a vassal state under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. And you can see this in 2 Kings chapter 24. It was during this time that Nebuchadnezzar took the finest and the brightest young men from the city of Jerusalem and took them into Babylon, including, of course, Daniel. After three years of serving Nebuchadnezzar, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, rebelled against the Babylonian rule, and he kind of got into this coalition with uh, Egypt and some other places, and they tried to, uh, you know, push back against the rule of Babylon, and then Nebuchadnezzar rolled back into town again, and around 597 B.C., laid siege to Jerusalem, and he took control of it, and he looted it, and he looted the temple, and he brought most of the population of Judah back in captivity, leaving the poorest people and leaving King Zedekiah to rule in Jerusalem with these poor people. So, based on the track record, Jeremiah has been right. Nebuchadnezzar, twice now, has come into town and asserted his control over the region, taking the people and the riches, Zedekiah's own father, and vessels from the temple. And you notice how it went into this elaborate discussion about the vessels from the temple? Why is that so important? What's the relevance of that? What's the big deal with the vessels? Well, not only are the vessels, you know, polished brass, bronze, and they were very 
valuable, they were also viewed as very sacred, very sacred. You see, if you go back to Exodus chapter 25 through 31, there are six chapters of, and we're not going to read them all today, praise God, uh, six chapters of elaborate detail given by God to Moses from Mount Sinai about how the tabernacle shall be built and the furnishings for it, and how it should be all cared for. Six chapters, all very meticulous, because it was all going to be part of the tent of meeting where God was going to dwell. Exodus 25 says in verse number 8, Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them, according to all that I'm going to show you, and this is the next six chapters, as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furniture so you shall construct it. So, this is all very important and meticulous and, you know, the dwelling place of God. Got that? Okay. So, the fact that the Babylonians were able to come into this temple now, take the vessels of the house of the Lord, they've already done this, and they've already taken it back to Babylon, what does that signify? What is that communicating? The fact that God has already allowed some of the vessels to be taken to Babylon proves he's not defending this temple. And that's what all the false teachers were saying. We got the temple, we're okay. If God has already told you twice that the Babylonians are going to come and take the city, and it's already happened twice, and they already have some of these important vessels, then this proves that Jeremiah is probably telling you the truth. So what makes you think He's going to be wrong on this one. If it's happened twice now, why do you think it's not going to happen a third time? The people could look at Jeremiah's track record of being right, and they could look at the false prophet's track record of being wrong. How many times do you have to get it wrong before we'll concede? Yeah, you're probably fake news, eh? You're probably not trustworthy source of information. I mean, I like what they're saying. You know, we won't go into slavery, but the fact of the matter is they keep getting it wrong. And Jeremiah keeps getting it right. And that's how Mrs. McNutt knew little Johnny was lying to his mom and dad because he had a track record of lying to the other children and lying to her face and lying to his parents. So chances are he's probably lying about his parents. So the track record is the obvious indicator, which is one of the reasons why I believe the Bible. Because I've seen the Bible's track record. I've seen it in the lives of other people, the changes that it's made in people's lives. And I've seen it in my own life. It keeps being proven true. When people obey it and when they abide by it and they trust in it, I see the changes and the blessings and the victories for myself. I've seen when I've honored the Lord and obeyed him, I've been blessed. But when I live by the flesh and I obey the word, it has costed me. I, I get tempted to do things the flesh likes. I start worrying about the consequences because I know they're coming. And I start praying, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of being disobedient. Lord, help me. I don't want to go back into that mess. Lord, have mercy. The Bible's not just stories about people who live long ago and far away. No, the Bible is alive and dynamic. And it speaks to us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. As the psalmist says, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb is the law of the Lord, the word of God. I, I ha have to ask the Lord to forgive me for not valuing his word enough. I do value it, but I never seem to be able to remember just how valuable. It's, it's more precious than gold. You know, I forget that. I, it, it's... It's, it's so easy to get apathetic and nonchalant to value stuff and creature comforts and entertainment. You know, sometimes I pay more attention to Netflix than I do God's Word. You know, just got to be honest about that. That's a shame because I know how vital it is. I know it's truth. The track record of all the prophecies that have come true all throughout history prove it's true. The track record of how it changes lives and even societies prove it. The track record of what happens to people and culture who reject it prove it's true. So, you know, I don't know a lot of stuff. I, I really can't tell you if all the scientific studies are true or 
if they're false or which is which. And I, I can't tell you which media is right and which one's lying to you. I can't tell you which government institution is reliable and which one's unreliable or which medical facility is good and which one you'll probably die if you go there. I can't tell you which brand of whatever you like to buy is best. Buy, buy foreign or buy, you know, American made. Kevin, sorry, I don't know which one. You know I don't know all these things. The reality is everything people's involved with is probably going to be a mixed bag, right? All these political groups and all these things and all these products and everything we're involved in, there's going to be some good and there's going to be some bad. There's going to be some truth. There's going to be some false. There'll be some helpful, some hurtful. There'll be some pros and there'll be some cons. But what I can tell you, good thing I can tell you something this morning. I don't know why you come back. I can tell you this beyond a shadow of a doubt. God's word is true. And since I know this is true, when I hear people agreeing with it, I tend to trust them. When I hear people disagreeing with it, rejecting it, denying it, contradicting it, refuting it, opposing it, challenging it, disputing it, how many synonyms can I use? Let's keep going. Neg neg negating it, debating it, changing it, misinterpreting it. If I hear someone who thinks they've disproven it, I know they're lying. They're falsifiers. They're deceivers. Now, maybe they themselves are deceived and genuinely think that they're telling the truth, but repeating a lie, if you don't know it's a lie, still doesn't make you any less an accomplice of deception, does it? No, if you're repeating it, you're still repeating lies. I know my high school biological teacher did not sign a pact with the devil to destroy my faith by teaching evolution. I know he was just repeating what the educational system of Canada had endorsed him to teach and what some professor taught him. Nevertheless, that doesn't make evolution any less a lie, does it? You know, and in fifth grade, I had this little epiphany sitting there in my little 11-year-old brain, listening to these people, my teachers, I thought, ah, these people don't know as much as they think. He's lacking some information. Or he's rejecting facts and he believes these lies. Which is it? I wonder. Maybe I should tell him. I tell him about dinosaurs. I'll bring you into my books and I'll show him all the things I had read. And he just looked confused and a little bit frustrated and said, this was his conclusion after I took over the class and gave a procreation lesson. He said, if you paid more attention to your English as you did your Bible, you'd get straight A's. I was like, oh, I'll take that. <laughs> you know, the children, the younger ones, they don't, they, you know, if they haven't, how they've been raised. See, I was raised at a Bible institute. I went to conferences on evolution versus creation. I mean, I was in that stuff, like saturated. So I had that information. So the rest of my kids in my class, most of them didn't have that. So, you know, they, they, they just didn't know. People often have limited inf information, right? They just don't know. And uh, if you've grown up in an environment where you tend to always do what you've always done and what's been passed down to you and you've never received that information, many times people grow up in false religions. They, they aren't intentionally lying. They just haven't heard the other side. That's one thing. But then there are the prophets, right? And they know. God didn't tell them anything, but they're saying he did. See, there are people who do know God's word, but they've just rejected it. And that's all around us, isn't it? There's people, I know what the Bible says, I just don't believe that. And our universities are loaded with that, our educational system is loaded with that, and all around. So when I hear them say, right is wrong and wrong is right, and they try to influence the nation away from truth to believe lies. Well, then I know they're just probably liars, and I, I can't believe, I can't trust them. If you tell me a woman can kill a baby and that's her right, I, I can't believe you, anything you say. I can't trust you. I don't care how many stats and studies and scenarios you quote. You're contradicting God. And these, are, these, these prophets are contradicting God. Nebuchadnezzar's been there two times. He's already looted this temple. Look at the facts, man. And then he goes into this very elaborate kind of test, litmus test he gives them. Verse 18. It says, but if they, the prophets, and if the word of the Lord is with them, well, let them now entreat the Lord of hosts 
that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of Judah, the king of Judah in Babylon, may not go to Babylon. If they're telling the truth, then we will not see these vessels go to Babylon. They're just going to stay right here. For thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the pillars and the seas and the stands and the, the rest of the vessels that are in the city, which Babylon, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, did not take when he carried off in exile Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from Jerusalem to Babylon. Yes, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the vessels that are left in the house. They will be carried off. Right? So see what Jeremiah is doing there? He said, God's telling me these vessels are going to Babylon. And they're telling you they're not. So let's just see what happens. This will be the test. And they, they say God's saying this, and I'm saying God's saying that. And let's just watch where these vessels go. And then we'll know. It reminded me very much of uh, Elijah on Mount Carmel, right? And he says, ah, you guys say about God, uh, Baal's God. You got 400 prophets all over here. There's a little old me over here. And I say, I say, Yahweh's God. Well, let's just test it, right? And you make your altar, and I'll make this altar, and you pray to Baal, and, and I'll pray to Yahweh. And how about whoever answers and does the God thing and shoots the fire down here, they'll be God, right? And we'll see what happens. And that was a great test. And that's kind of the same thing Jeremiah is doing here. How about the people... The prophet whose words concerning the vessels of the temple, whatever happens to them, will believe him. If they bring them back, then they'll be right. And if they're taken away, then I'll be right. And that's what you have to do, don't you? Not get caught up in all these debates and emotional blusters and all these finger pointing and all these he said, she said. Just get down to the facts. Let's see how this works in real life. James says, faith without works is dead show you say you got faith and i say you got works i will show you my faith by my works let's see how this works let's see what it pans out in your life they know we are christians by our love people can call me all kinds of names because of my beliefs and they can try to take the moral high ground and claim evil is good and make it sound really good and many people will believe their message because, ooh, that's what they want to hear. But I'm prepared to stand on the track record of the Word of God because I know history and because I know how this thing works. Once the children of Israel were able to get the Word of God when they were in Egypt, it took them out of slavery. And every time they followed the Word of God, God prospered them. And every time they rejected the Word of God, it cost them. And when they rejected Jeremiah's Word of God from Jeremiah, it cost them the temple and it cost them the land. And then they, again, they did it again. They rejected Jesus and they rejected the gospel. And again, it cost them the temple and it cost them the land. But when uh, they, people turned back to the Word of God and received the Word of God, it would change the world. Right? You had the whole Roman Empire and all their pagan gods, and then this whole movement of the gospel of Jesus Christ was going on. And what happened? People started receiving the word of God, and it changed the whole, holy, the whole Roman Empire, was flipped over, and the pagan gods were booted out, and then the, the church began, and it changed the world. It changed all of the Western society. And then when they rejected the word of God, and the whole thing got corrupted, and the, it, the, whole, the whole Catholic church then got corrupted, and it, it went into decay, and then the, the world went into the dark ages but then the reformers came along and they brought back the word of god and they translated it into the people's language and they got it out of the latin and they got it into the vernacular of the everyday people and then people could read it for themselves and it started the reformation movement which started the uh, age of enlightenment and which brought the liberty and which brought the what brought the freedom and you look at the world and you look at history and god has prospered the nations who have upholded his word as the standard of truth and righteousness these parts of the world have been prospered and then when you look around and you look at the places where the word of god has been rejected and denied they sit there even in today in poverty and despair and then you look at our own nation and you look around now honestly look around and you look at the regions where they celebrate godlessness look how they're destroying themselves because immorality always leads to decay and degradation 
But then you look at the changes, the transformation the gospel can make. First in the life, the individual who receives Jesus Christ and the immediate change that takes place. And they are a new creation, a new man. Old things pass away. They've been born again and all things become new. And then it affects their home and their family. And then where the two or three are gathered, Jesus said, I'm in the midst. And then a church is born and a church speaking in truth and in, in the spirit can change a community. And and a community, a county, and a county estate. And that's what we got to do, Faith Bible Church. We got to let the truth, and we got we to gotta live the truth, and we got to live our faith, and let our track record be seen. Let the facts speak for themselves. Jesus commanded, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The way people can see the truth is we have to live it out. They, have to, they can compare the destruction of their experiencing by living by the lies versus the goodness that we are shown when we shine for Jesus. And that's what we got to do. And then people can say, well, I don't know, but these people here sure seem to got something that's working. They got the love and they got the joy and they got the peace and their lives are reflecting it. So keep shining, brothers and sisters. Keep shining that you can be the, the track record of what God can do in the lives of people who trust his word. Lord Jesus, we pray that we will trust your word no matter what is said to be the right thing in culture, no matter what the uh, postmodern world, our society, no matter what is incorrect or politically incorrect or all that stuff, let us be uh, standing on your word and let all man be a liar and God be true and that we will hold to your truth no matter what it cost us. And then you would shine, because we know if we followed your ways, you would pour out your blessings. It would be so obvious. And men could see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.